Hello, Wicked members. My name is Maya Shukari, and I am Wicked's Education Committee Director. I'm happy to introduce our series, Finding Your Niche. In this series, we will interview female criminal defense lawyers who practice in a specific area within criminal law. The goal of our series is to highlight the work and accomplishments of female criminal defense lawyers, but it is also a way for us to introduce you to specialty areas within criminal law. We hope we can help you find your niche. Enjoy the series. Hello, Lisa. How are you? I'm great, Maya. How are you? I'm fine, thank you. I'm very happy to meet you today and to chat with you a bit about your practice and what you do and your contribution for criminal law. So thank you for taking the time to be with us today. Thank you so much for asking me. I'm so excited because this is what I feel like I was born to do. And so if people are watching and looking at this and thinking, is this a career for me or is this a career for me as a woman even, uh, I'm so excited to give uh, how I feel about that to you. Well, I'm really excited that you're here. So speaking about you know, uh, what you do, can you tell us what your niche area is? Absolutely. So my niche area is major crime. Um, and my uh, the majority of what I do are murder cases, and the majority of what I do is jury work within those media, uh, those murder cases. So I've been practicing for almost twenty years. I was called in '04, um, and uh, from there I articled with a principal that uh, was doing uh, significantly large cases. I went to a smaller center to do it. So I'm I'm based in Vancouver now but I went up into the interior of British Columbia to work with this one particular lawyer who was uh, doing all of the murder cases in the interior. So by the time I articled and did two years with him, I had six or seven murder cases under my belt and then moved on mm -hmm. from there. Um, so I have a 60% trial practice and 40% appellate practice. So half of my 60% uh, of my practice is murder trials and jury cases. The other 40% are, are conviction and sentence appeals. Okay, so that's really interesting because it seems like, based on what you're saying, that you got into doing uh, murder cases very early on in your career. Um, so was it just luck, though, or is it uh, intentional? Did you ask to do these cases? or? Uh... So uh, one of the reasons that I was looking for a particular practitioner in the criminal law area, and one of the reasons that I moved away from what is my home, I grew up in Vancouver, was because I specifically wanted to work with a lawyer who was doing significant trial cases. And this was the lawyer who, out of the ones that I interviewed with, I felt was going to be the best fit because he was a solo practitioner and someone who I knew was doing a lot of jury trials. And I knew that it was work that I would eventually want to do. So I figured that even if I was taking care of his provincial court practice while he was in Supreme Court, even if he didn't take me with him, I would at least get the experience of watching how one of these cases is prepared. And instead, my principal was incredibly generous. And so whenever he was on a murder case, whether he was being paid by legal aid or not, I joined him as junior. So I knew fairly early on in my law school career that this was what I wanted to do. So because of that, it, it really informed my choice of principal and then later informed my choice of who I wanted to work with when those junior opportunities came up okay so nice so so it looks like that you really knew right from the beginning what you wanted to do and where you wanted to head into in criminal law and who you wanted to work with um uh, but was it easy for you to get to what you wanted to do no, absolutely not. In fact, I didn't go into law school uh, to do criminal law. I was working for uh, Hachette, which is a, a major publishing house yeah. and uh, retail publishing organization. They have uh, offices in Toronto. So I was working out of Toronto during my undergraduate degree at UBC and uh, was starting to move into management there and really was enjoying their Canadian operations. And they said to me, if you go and get a law degree, it will be easier for you to eventually move to either New York or Paris offices. And that sounded amazing. Why wouldn't you want to do that? Um, and so I wrote the LSATs and went into law school fully convinced that I was going to go into uh, legal representation for authors or book contracts or work with Hachette in their executive structure. So it was a surprise to get in and learn that even though I was good at contracts, it was the only thing in my first year that I actually did well on the exam. Um, I actually was quite pulled towards criminal law. And then in my second semester, sorry, my first semester of second year, 
um, I did a clinic in the downtown east side and I still wasn't a hundred percent sure, even though I loved that work more than I ever thought that I could love anything. Um, so I summered at a second year mid-sized civil firm um, and really got a taste of what the day in day out of being a civil lawyer was like. And so from there, I was able to say, no, being the day to day of being a criminal lawyer is so exciting, so fast paced, so uh, in and out of court, so interacting with with peers you know, your other lawyers, as well as people that you can actually help, I was completely hooked from there. So that was how I knew. I knew that the civil firm wasn't going to keep me on. Um, we were not a good fit. And I knew that right from the get go. So I knew that I was going to have to change firms to article. And then I started thinking about what I really wanted out of that experience. And that's what led me to Paul Daniel, who was my principal. Amazing guy. And when you say that you you knew that you weren't a good fit in the civil firm, uh, what was it? Was it because of your personality or the way you were working or your interests? Like, uh, can you maybe clarify uh, more? Absolutely. Um, the I had expected a an experience like my clinical term, which was here are 50 files that are your responsibility. You better get learning them. You better get into court with them. You've got a client showing up at 11 a.m. All of that was incredibly exciting to me. The idea that I would have to read and know these files and be able to help people find what was best for their priorities and for them. Mm -hmm. And the civil firm that I was with, they were lovely people. I have nothing bad to say about them. And they're, they're good hearted human beings that I really think want to do the right thing in terms of business contracts and whatnot. But there were some things like uh, one of my principals at the second year firm was a riparian rights expert. So all that she did all day was basically look at water flow and who owns what part of the port. And if a good comes into the port, is it under the regulations? And it moved incredibly slowly. And uh, so between that and the fact that I noticed that even the second and third year associates weren't going to court in the same way that I had been expecting to because of this clinical term, I was actually quite disappointed. And a lot of the seniors were going to court and giving the juniors the, the prep work and the things that they needed to do. And part of my personality is that if I get a file, like a, a murder file these days can be 30 to 50,000 pages. I wanna know every one of those pages. And what I was finding was that was not the way that the civil firms were working. They were working application by application, Often the lawyers knew sort of the overview of the case, but not the specifics. And that just for me, the obsessive ability to go in and read all of this material and just know it cold is something that I've always really enjoyed. So I just knew it wasn't for me is sort of the, the easiest way of putting that. And they were very good to me. They're very, very lovely human beings who, you know, their Wilson Estates lawyer, for example, is one of the top in the country. She keeps getting, getting nominated for it over and over and winning. And she's fabulous. And she taught me a lot about Wilson Estates. And if I never see a will or, or an estate file ever again, I will be a happy woman. <laughs> and it's difficult to beat the crazy stories we get in criminal law. <laughs> oh, the stories are absolutely amazing. I mean, there's there's no other profession where you can get a guy acquitted of car theft, go down to the cafeteria at 222 Main Street to brag about it and get a call from the police officer that your client's trying to steal your car in the parkade. It just, you know, there, there's no other, you don't get stories like that. We have so many stories in this office, a very small tight knit office. And so we have a lot of stories about clients and uh, the, the things that they do and uh, how we can best help them while also often having a good sense of humor about uh, the fact that human beings are human beings and they do weird exactly. things. And sometimes you're dealing with the weirdest of the weird. No. Okay, so you said that you're a, a smaller office. Uh, how many lawyers are there in your office, Lisa? So there are two lawyers. There's myself and Jazz Manget, who is um, my associate. He's been my associate for a decade. Um, I've been really, really lucky, actually, with staff. So my um, business manager has been with us for 15 years. We have a part-time receptionist who comes in when volume's heavy, so she's been with us for five. Jazz has been with me for 10. He started as my SFU criminology student, uh, did all, all of his summers with me, articled with me, and has joined the firm, so he's been with me for a decade. Brilliant man and just an, a, a joy to have as, a, uh, as an associate on a file. And uh, then we have one uh, young contract lawyer who comes and goes, and she's absolutely fabulous but she's not exclusive to us she gets to uh, spend a lot of time she's very very talented so she gets to spend a lot of time with a lot of different seniors so that's interesting so it is possible to have a practice where you do major crimes and operate within a smaller setting you don't have to be in a big firm to do that oh a hundred percent you don't in okay. fact 
Um, I think that a lot of what makes our firm really successful is that we, just for that exact reason, we keep our client list a bit smaller. Um, and so when clients call, they get Diane and Diane has been involved with every aspect of their file, whether there's a retainer or not. She does, um, you know, the liaising with legal aid if we need it. Um, she's often the one who when the file first comes in, if there's initial protects, to, to tell me what's in them and what's arrived that day, she'll read them. So she'll have some insight. Um, Diane is um, towards retirement age now, and that gives her a very wide ambit of human behavior that she's seen over her life. So that experience is absolutely crucial to me in terms of often she can assess people a lot faster than I can because she's been talking to them on the phone. Um, she's dealt with them if they've dropped in to do something here. Um, I see the appointment, but she sees both the good and the bad behavior. So it we really work as a very, very well-functioning, well-oiled machine. And it, uh, it's a joy to come into this office every day. And I think that that's one of the things that I would really get across to people is that if you have joy in your working situation, the, these big, tough files, and they are, you have to be with the right people doing them. You have to be able to be committed to working with somebody 18 hours a day that you really like. Mm -hmm. um, to do these files because otherwise they can be absolutely miserable. So um, if you are in the situation where you're looking at a, you know, setting up a larger file practice, make sure that the people around you are going to be the ones that you can laugh with on the bad days, um, you know, celebrate with on the good days. And really we're, we're very much like a small family. Um, my uh, Diane, uh, I've been with my uh, fiance for five years and uh, Diane and I've been together uh, 15, so Longer. She, she's my she's my long term relationship, and she's not yeah. she's not wrong. Let's put it that way. Okay, that's very nice. But uh, you also mentioned at the beginning of the interview that you do uh, appellate work as well. That must be because appellate work is a different type of beast, and it's also very demanding and very time consuming. That must be a bit difficult, though, to manage with the type of. Uh, uh, crimes that you do like when you do major crimes like the disclosure is very heavy it's like you mentioned thousands and thousands of pages so how do you manage having a practice where you do both well for for me so the first rule is i never do my own appeals I always pass those off because doing your own appeals leaves you open to the court of appeals saying, well, Ms. Helps, wasn't that a strategy decision? Um, the first time that I ever heard that off of a case that I'd been a junior as, it occurred to me that I should never do my own appeals. You want someone else to have another eye on it. You want the client to have the best possible representation that they can. So often there are lawyers that I swap appeals with and whatnot. And what's very, it, it comes down to time management. You have to have the time to write these files. And in the beginning, when I was getting started, I would write uh, appellate fact on the weekends and then reserve the weeks for trial time. And I did that for about 10 years. And it was a lot of work and incredibly demanding, but it really built my practice to where I could say, okay, this is what I actually do is I do trial, large scale trial work and I do appellate practice. And what it's allowed me to do is things like, I can often take um, the discs now, especially because before when we were doing typed out transcripts, and again, that's how long I've been in practice is we didn't <laughs> have discs of, of transcripts at some points. Um, I can take those discs, I can take my computer and I can go um, away for a few weeks at a time and only work on those files. And it allows for a greater ambit in terms of my being away. So to give you an example, before COVID, uh, about a year before COVID, uh, I took two appellate files and went to Greece for six weeks, worked in the mornings or when it was too hot to be out in the world, and then just basically had sort of a working vacation without having to, um, you know, expend vacation time or really do anything. I could just go out on the veranda and, you know, eat, uh, eat ripe vegetables and uh, go for a swim and then come back and work a bit on the factum. So there's a lot of advantages to being able to work your schedule so that you need large swaths of time off to read and write and work. Um, whereas, of course, a lot of the things that you're doing in a murder trial are very dynamic. So mm -hmm. for me, it's really good. It suits my personality really well. I, I like to be quite intense when I'm working a, a jury trial. And then knowing that I have a sizable period of time off just to sort of read and write and think is one of my greatest joys. And um, my spouse does the exact same thing, except for the crown. So it's uh, married up over the years very well, where we can uh, take files that we are working on individually and go to different places and work on them as long as the information is secure when we're traveling through airports and borders and things. 
Okay, that's very nice. I wanted to ask you though, Lisa, do you find, given that you do both uh, appeals and trials, do you find that they've helped you? Like does doing uh, appellate work help you uh, in your trial work and vice versa or not necessarily? Oh, they're hand in glove because the appellate work keeps me so current. And what I can say is that when you get to be towards a senior counsel, I wouldn't necessarily call myself senior counsel yet, but when you get towards that place, what you find is a lot of the um, young counsel coming out of law school are way better informed on the law than you are because it's current, it's new, they've gone through it. Um, for example, the JJ decision, which was released June 30th, um, I, you know, I, if I hadn't had an application that specifically dealt with it mm -hmm. three days later, I don't know if I would necessarily would have dropped and read it right, right then, whereas somebody coming out of this session's PLTC will know that decision backwards and forwards, I would assume. So what appellate work does for me is that in certain subjects where I read a factum, think to myself, or I read a, I read a judgment, think to myself, well, there's the issue for the factum. Um, but I have to research that issue to make sure that I'm totally current and not making an assumption about what the law is. That has been incredibly helpful to me. And a lot of the lawyers I know that are working at this level, they feel exactly the same way because as you grow into the profession, um, because you get the skills under your belt and they call it practice for a reason, you're not competent. It, to my mind, you're not competent to do a major case until at least five years. You're not good at it until 10. So for me, the ability to keep recharged on what the law actually is, as opposed to what I think it was based on what I was taught in law school 23 years ago now, is very, very helpful to a major crime practice because what it does is it in essence pays me for doing research into an aspect that I can use for any other part of my practice. Mm -hmm. That's a very interesting point. Um, and maybe if you can just describe, because I know you said that what you do is major crimes. So we know it that includes murder, obviously, but what other types of uh, crimes would that also include, just to clarify uh, the types of files that you uh, that you do? So any significant or serious personal injury offense, a lot of sex assaults, a lot of aggravated sex assaults, a lot of um, uh, aggravated assaults. Um, I do quite a bit of drug work where there's a warrant or a wiretap. Um, I personally find warrants really um, fun to take apart, which I know is not uh, often the, right. the way that most defense counsel feel. So I enjoy a larger drug trial where there will be several cascading warrants off of the initial wiretap warrant or a tracking warrant or a search warrant, those kinds of things. So I, I do do some of that work as well. Um, generally, though, personal injury offenses are kind of where at the higher end are kind of where my practice is grounded. All right. And Lisa, did you face any particular challenges uh, during your practice uh, due to the fact that you were a female uh, defense lawyer or not necessarily? Oh, yes, absolutely. I don't think that there's anybody that can deny that sexism is it plays a very significant part um, in some of the experiences that we as criminal uh, trial lawyers have. Um, for example, 20 years ago, when I came into the bar in British Columbia, there were only five or six senior women counsel working in criminal law. And I heard over and over again, girls can't be criminal lawyers in an elite level. Um, and and it, it was phrased in different ways. Uh, girls don't do murder cases. Girls don't do murder cases on their own. Uh, girls won't get the gang work. Um, all of those things that um, were said to me, some of which were said in a concerned and caring way, i.e. you're not going to succeed here, you should build something else before this all mm -hmm. falls apart, uh, is sort of one side of it. And then the other side of it was um, just, we don't want you here, you're intruding on a playing field that's ours. The other thing is, of course, is there's some sexism from other women. And we don't talk about this as much as maybe we should, because if we got it out in the open, maybe we'd be able to deal with it. But there were a number of women um, in that generation above me, and some of them were amazing, do not get me wrong. There have been some allies in that generation that I will never, ever be able to repay for the, for the ways in which they've gone out of their way for me. But one of the things that I'm very careful to do is try and nurture young female defense counsel, because what happened, I think, in the generation above us was this, there was this perception that if there's a seat at the table for a woman, it's for one woman. So if there's 12 seats at the table, 11 of them are fan, for men, they've designated one for a woman, and it's going to be whomever the person is that, they've, that, that has decided that it's theirs. So a lot of that was rolled down. You, you don't get the seat at the table. That's my seat at the table. Whereas I think that what you do in a situation like that is you say, oh, I'm, I'm one of 12. 
uh, the other 11 are men. What I'm going to do is add some more seats to the table as mm -hmm. opposed to saying, this is my seat and I will protect it until I either decide that I don't want that seat anymore. Or alternatively, I decide to give that seat up to somebody that I want as a successor. And that's not the way. And I think that that attitude is dying out, but it was very, very prevalent when I started. And I think that the more of us that there are adding seats to the table, the bigger the table has to get. A rising tide carries all boats, all of those things. They're cliched, but they're totally true. I think that it is a really significant thing to make sure that whatever you, you're healing within the practice when you allow for those extra seats at the table, um, I think that that just continues and spirals and makes more opportunities for everyone. And I can also say that um, in the early part of my practice, it's true that I didn't get um, the gang work. I didn't get the very serious criminality work at first because I was an unknown entity and there were a lot of male lawyers who'd been, who'd been practicing a lot longer than I had. Why would they put their trust in a young woman, especially when I was you know, 26 years old and just sort of coming out of, of my being principled and, uh, you know, getting, getting my practice started. It's way easier now. And I think that persistence really pays off. So that would be the, the message that I would give to young female counsel who are struggling to build a practice is that that persistence does pay off. You have to look for different opportunities. You have to do the things that are going to bring your cases to the attention of um, the practice in terms of what I did, for example, was I was um, the junior counsel uh, with the brilliant Gil McKinnon on Sinclair. So um, after Sinclair, I wrote a guide for defense lawyers about how to uh, properly do a major crime interview um, when you get a 10B call in the middle of the night. And that got published in The Advocate, which is our uh, lawyer-wide magazine. And over the years, the amount of people that have approached me and said, I would have had no idea what to do when I got this call. But the only reason that I did was because the checklist in the back of that article gave me a really good sense of where to go. So you need to look for those opportunities. You need to get known within the profession. But the work will and does follow. It's just you have to, to find seniors that you like working with. You have to find a way to break through that initial um, I'm not particularly experienced and I want this work, but I don't know what I'm going to do from here. And, and there are those opportunities out there. I, I really, getting involved with the CBA has been huge for me. Getting involved with our trial lawyers association of British Columbia has been huge for me. Um, getting involved with the International Society for the Reform of Criminal Law, which is based here in Vancouver. Um, their conference is October 21st this year. I highly recommend that to anyone who's in, in, uh, who loves the bigger ideas of justice and what it means to be in a criminal justice system that's uh, a democratic one. So I highly recommend recommend that all of these different avenues that you as a young counsel can pursue to work hand in glove with the work that you're actually doing, I cannot recommend them enough. And I would say that really there's been times that getting involved in those things have saved my life because it can be a very lonely thing to do a murder trial. It can be a very lonely thing to do any kind of trial if you don't feel supported. And really that, those are the organizations that have made me feel. Lawyers Assistance Project is another one. Um, and the other thing that I would just say about that, just to segue very, very briefly, is that um, there are organizations that have literally saved my life. There's absolutely no doubt that this profession has an endemic level of mental illness. Um, we are the most depressed. Um, we are the people that face the highest numbers of burnout. We are the council that don't talk about the trauma that happens when you're dealing with human beings hurting other human beings. Um, I have used an access lawyer assistance project myself. Um, I have a trauma counselor that I deal with uh, for about six weeks after I do a murder trial, just to make 100% sure that none of it sits and festers. Um, and I have an ongoing relationship with a therapist that um, in my 30s and 40s has been the most beneficial about how to grow myself, because we think about growing a practice, we think about growing as professionals, yeah. but you also come to a point where you know that not having a lot of time outside or outside interest becomes very difficult. And I can say this to all young counsel, there is absolutely no shame in going in and using, accessing those resources and making sure that you're mentally healthy enough to take on these large files because people do brutal things to each other. And it often feels like our responsibility to remedy it somehow. And it absolutely is not. And anybody suffering from depression, anxiety, get the help as fast as you can and continue with it as long as you can. Um, I've been with the trauma counselor now since the beginning of my practice. And I can say that really there have been times that I've stepped off 
people doing brutal things to each other and ended a trial and fallen into anxiety or depression. And it has been the thing that I would say has made the most uh, significant uh, link to my personal life. And, and I really, really encourage anybody um, to talk as openly as you can about mental health, make sure that you have people that can back you up both personally and professionally, and know that there's no shame in taking time off, doing courses, going through therapy, all of that is incredibly important for your own mental health and your own ability to form relationships and attachments that mean something to you. All right. Uh, now, I know you answered my last question in uh, several ways, especially uh, with uh, the notion of being persistent in this profession and reaching out to other associations. But is there anything else, uh, Lisa, that you would add for people who are or lawyers who are maybe still relatively new and who do want to develop a niche in major crimes, other than reaching out to other associations and building connections with other uh, lawyers and also being persistent, what else would you suggest for them to do so they can get into this uh, type of uh, niche? I would absolutely reach out to your local legal aid organization and make sure that you know they know what kind of cases that you want to take. And I, it, I don't know how it works in Ontario. I have not dealt with LAO before, um, but certainly in most other provinces, legal aid is small enough that you'll get to know your case managers. You'll get to know the assessment lawyers just by virtue of being in the same community with them, at least here in British Columbia, the uh, Legal Aid Society here contracts working lawyers to do their assessments, contracts working lawyers to do um, a lot of their case management decisions or budgetary decisions, get to know them, um, get to know who they are, and make sure that you ask for those kinds of cases. So there's a certain type of case that you want to work on. Let's say you're a junior and you want to work a murder case, but you don't have a connection to do it. Um, one of the ways is to reach out to other lawyers, but I would highly recommend you to reach out to Legal Aid as well and say, um, you know, I'm a junior lawyer. There's a certain set of skills that I'd really like to know. Um, Complainants Council right now is a burgeoning area of criminal defense. Um, Legal Aid British Columbia has asked for anyone who has expressions of interest in, in Complainants Council. So look for those expressions of interest. Look for those um, places where your funding body might have more uh, opportunities than you know about and just even calling and getting a sense of their intake department or asking someone if you can have an appointment with them to just go over the kinds of things that they're that they're seeing um, is definitely something that you can do reaching out to senior counsel even just for mentorship there have been times that I've had a cup of coffee with somebody who's phoned me up and said you know are you willing to take 15 minutes out of your day so that you can talk to me a junior lawyer and then three months later something walks in the door that they've specifically said that they want I always remember that and I know that most of us do. Um, those of us who work with, with juniors tend to know the juniors in the, in the different subject areas just because they're the peers of our, of our associates. So if there's something that comes up that, for example, Jazz is committed to doing another trial, I'll frequently reach out beyond the boundaries of my practice, but I need to know who those people are. Um, mm -hmm. I need to know that somebody's keen to do something before I say, hey, I've got a murder case with a really picky issue that I need 20 or 30 hours of research on. Why don't you let me know if that's something that you want to do? Or, hey, I'm going to go in and cross-examine this particular type of person. You told me that that was an interest of yours. So come on in and see a Vetrovet cross. That, that's something that I think that those, um, the funding decision, the funding body is definitely somewhere that they should look to. Um, definitely senior counsel or their peers who are working with seniors that might do the kind of work that they want. Um, any of those kinds of avenues are wonderful for getting the kind of experience that you want. And also go to court as much as you can. And again, we're, we're in Zoom court hell, so uh, you may not be able to physically go. But when you can again, or if there's a time that the public health orders drop and you can go in person, go to court, watch court, get to know who the judges are. And when I say that, I don't mean personally, I mean, watch them in court and see if they're judges that you would want to work with, make those things, watch other lawyers, see if you would do it the same way, use it as an intellectual exercise. If you are physically in court watching, um, at least in British Columbia, people will stop you, ask you who you are, um, you know, what you're seeing, what you're interested in, those kinds of things. Going to court is the silver bullet and always has been. 
when I was uh, very junior in practice, I had my own office. Uh, there were times that I didn't have a client walk through the door. There would be long afternoons that I would go and sit in Supreme Court and just watch anything that had a criminal designation to it, um, just to see what other lawyers were doing because it was, and it was such a massively huge way of not only expanding my skill set but getting noticed by those lawyers. So one of the reasons that my cross-examination is very firm, is a lawyer that I went and watched. I then asked to be a senior when my first murder trial walked through the door. Um, and he said, I will do the Vetrovet cross, but you're going to need to do everything else because if this is what you want to do and take on, I want to back you up and make sure that that Vetrovet cross, which was the most crucial of the entire case, mm -hmm. goes properly. But I also want you to get the skills to do it. And every time that there was something new that cropped up, he would take me to lunch and we would go over those skills and then I go into court and do them. And I have to say that I don't know any senior, um, at least out here, that wouldn't be willing to take 15 minutes or a half an hour to speak with a junior or to take them to lunch or alternatively to say, these are the skills that if you're interested in them, this is how I would learn them. So definitely I think the peer to peer as well as the senior to junior connections and the going to court and making your face visible. So that even if people don't know your name, they look at you and think, oh, she belongs here, which will give you sort of an entree into, into the, the clutch of defense lawyers that you're going to be dealing with probably for most of your career if they're in the same city that you're in. Well, that's really good advice. Thank you so much, Lisa. Uh, those were my questions for you today, but thank you for all the valuable advice that you gave us. And I'm sure that a lot of our members will be watching this interview will really enjoy everything that you said. So thank you so much for your time and for doing this for us on a weekend. <laughs> Thank you so much, Maya, and anything for Wicked. I'm so, so pleased and so grateful to be a part of the organization, and I'm really looking to up membership in British Columbia. So uh, any anyone who is out there who's watching in uh, British Columbia or Alberta, and you want to reach out, all of my uh, all of my biographical information is on the web at helpslaw.com, and uh, I would absolutely welcome any kind of feedback from juniors or any kind of questions. Um, and if you're not already a member of Wicked, I cannot recommend it enough. The listserv alone um, is funny and smart and full of brilliant women, and I cannot say enough good things. So if you're a woman or woman identifying, join Wicked. It's amazing. Thank you so much, Lisa. And we appreciate having you as a member of Wicked. And thank you so much for your time. 